good morning. Thanks for spending some time learning about uh, Cyclotron Road as a program and what some of our companies are up to. Uh, Pedram, thank you and Stanford for giving us an opportunity to talk about what it is and to share our vision. Um, if you're not familiar with Cyclotron Road, this is a program that we launched about five years ago in partnership with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, really the problem statement that we were trying to solve for was um, in a time, you know, 20, 2010, 2012, when there wasn't a lot of venture capital dollars that were interested in supporting what we would call hard science innovations or, or breakthroughs that are really um, grounded in advancements in the physical and the biological sciences. Um, for, for those people who had ideas about how we can dramatically shift how we think about uh, the consumption and the production of, of energy and resources, what is the pathway to translate those ideas that are really grounded in science into a commercially useful product? Uh, venture capital, especially being out in this area, is a fairly efficient financing mechanism uh, for high-risk ventures. Um, but after, I think we're now north of $32 billion in paid in capital over the last 15 years, and a whole lot less than that coming back to the investors, um, there was a lot of concern about what should be the financing mechanisms to do this translation from, from early stage science out into the marketplace. And if we don't have an efficient mechanism, then what type of opportunity are we creating for people who are trained in the fundamental advancements in these sciences, uh, but are personally and passionately motivated to start building the next generation products and widgets that lead to less CO2 and, and, um, and, and cleaner kilowatt hours produced. And so we didn't see a healthy pathway out there for those unique individuals. And so we set out with a whiteboard approach uh, to try to build that. And Cyclotron Road is a, is a team-based effort um, that was the result of that, um, of trying to solve that problem. So the way we've pulled this together is, is we thought about what is needed for this pathway. There was a few key elements. One is they needed time. Uh, two, they needed f some level of uh, finances and capital to get going. Uh, and then three, and a really critical element of it, was they needed access to the facilities and the infrastructure to actually get learning cycles on the technology and to begin developing it in a way that's not about publications and patents, but actually about doing the technology w development work that is needed to um, reduce the risk of bringing these innovations into the marketplace. And so what we set out to do and what we ended up creating is a program that every year we run a competition. It starts in October. Uh, we ask the applicants to respond to a, a, an evaluation mechanism that was invented by DARPA called the Hellemeyer Catechism Questions, which just get down into the nitty gritty. If, if you're going to work on a new innovation, make sure it's relevant for people. And um, every year we run a, a process of looking for what we would call elite technical scientists that are entrepreneurially oriented. We look for them across the world to propose their breakthrough ideas in, in energy and advanced computing uh, types of concepts. If they're awarded into the program, we support them with about a $500,000 seed grant uh, that we get from our partnerships with the US Department of Energy and now with DARPA and their microelectronics office. We can use that money to support up to two technical co-founders over a two-year time period um, so that they can be working on these projects 100% as a full-time job uh, and as a full-time commitment, not in their garages and, and in between um, having a full-time employment elsewhere. But then the, you know, beyond the two years and the, and the financing, a really critical element of this was recognizing that they need access to cutting-edge deposition, characterization, production systems, even at a, at a prototype and pre-prototype level. And so we had approached the director of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, a gentleman named Dr. Paul Alvisados, and said, if we can go out and find these really incredible people who are willing to throw their lives at tackling these really challenging translational problems, can we find a mechanism whereby they come and use Berkeley Lab um, and find the scientists, find the tools, find the facilities and the equipment that's needed for them to spend their time developing the technology not spending their time going out and trying to raise private capital before it's too early, not use their time to go and build out a lab uh, that's focused on commercialization before they've gotten through the basic development. So that's what we've did. We've, um, about every year, we bring in about 10 fellows or 10 projects uh, into this program. Um, we really focus on selecting the fellows that are committed to taking advancements in science and translating them into, into commercial 
um, into commercial use. Um, we've supported 54 fellows. That's led to the launching of about 40 companies out of the Berkeley Lab area. Um, and I think, you know, in general, to come into the program, the ideas have to be uh, so high impact and so risky that they can't attract private capital without this program. And a key element in what we think about how to select is um, who are the types of people and what are the types of technologies where in a two-year time frame they can significantly make some reductions in their technical and commercial risk that they'd be able to attract private capital. So over the course of those 40 companies, it's now about $100 million in additional outside, outside capital that these companies have been able to attract. The metric that is more important to us and that we really care about is how many of the projects have gone from an idea to a commercial product or at least a prototype that you can put into the hands of the customer. Uh, we've had three, go through, uh, three cohorts go through this program, about 15 companies. I think about over 80% of them have either built fully functional prototypes that are now being tested by um, industrial customers, or they've at least attracted a few million dollars of capital that's allowed them to say, you know, this is viable or this isn't viable. So the, the thing I'll wrap it up with is, you know, really excited to have this opportunity to share about our program and what we're working on. In terms of where you all can come into play, um, mentorship is a really big element of what we do. So with your proximity and your care for addressing these problems, um, we're constantly looking both at the program team and for our companies, people who want to come and provide additional financial support, business support, um, management leadership support uh, to our companies. Um, we spend a lot of time interacting with corporate partners to draw a connection between the projects that we're supporting and what industry is looking for. Uh, and certainly, um, capital is still scarce in this world. So um, I, that probably captures the majority of you in the room. Uh, my colleague MC and I will be at the table outside afterwards during the break. Um, and we have our newly minted books that capture more information about all the projects that we've been supporting in these two cohorts. Uh, and in the prior cohorts um, to take with you. So um, I think with that, let me get out of the way so you get to hear a little bit more about uh, some of the cool projects that we're working on. So Adrian. <clears throat> All right, thanks, uh, thanks Matt and Pedram and uh, everyone else uh, in this room for actually being here. Um, I'm uh, Adrian Albert. I'm a founder of a company uh, called TerraFuse, and we work on building uh, what we call physics-enabled AI for climate risk. But before I go into what that, all that means, uh, I just wanted to say that it's great to be back here uh, at uh, the Silicon Valley Energy Summit. Uh, I've been coming here to these events as a student, and it's always been great, and I see some familiar faces, uh, some new faces, so uh, uh, happy to be back. Um, so. Anyone in the audience here a uh, Game of Thrones fan? Uh, awesome. All right. Well, I really uh, like uh, George R. R. Martin's work, and uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, the original title of the book is called A Song of Ice and Fire. And this really resonates with me because uh, this is what uh, I see happening in the world right now. There's a lot uh, more of the fire and a lot less of the ice. Uh, going on and so we all live in California and we can uh, remember the the past couple of years that we've been losing a essentially a city uh, a year to fire uh, the most devastating fires in the c uh, country's really history uh, with the billions of dollars of impact and many lives lost and thousands of homes destroyed and this is not ever going to get any better especially with uh, the impact of climate change uh, in fact if you look at this uh, this chart that I uh, pulled from the climate assessment the uh, impact of climate change on the uh, devastation produced by wildfires is pretty much going to double in the next uh, years with, uh, uh, com compared to a world where there is no climate change. And in fact, this actually uh, is not just uh, abstract, it has some uh, significant financial consequences. We all know that uh, PG&E essentially went bankrupt earlier this year and uh, ins the insurance uh, industry in California is having a big, a big hit and uh, is really unable to cope with the magnitude of the losses. So, now, on the other end of the world, you know, the, uh, the polar ice caps in Greenland uh, and Antarctic, uh, and Antarctica are essentially melting, and they're doing so much faster than uh, at the rate that uh, we previously thought. And you may say, well, what is that uh, important for me right here in California? Um, 
An example closer to home is the Sierra Nevada snowpack. Essentially what's going on in the next several decades, there will be a whole lot less of the water or a whole lot less of the snow in the uh, mountain snowpack. And really that has an impact on uh, California's economy as we know it with, uh, with agriculture and hydropower being uh, mostly uh, the most impacted ones, uh, but uh, as well, uh, all as well. So uh, all of these are essentially just examples uh, to bring home the magnitude of the problem, but I don't really need to uh, preach to the choir. Everyone in, is in this, in this room is in this room because they you know, uh, have had some contact with the, these kinds of concepts before. What I really wanted to talk about is the fact that we are still uh, grossly inadequately equipped uh, from an analytical standpoint to, uh, to deal with these kinds of uh, uh, problems, uh, to model these kinds of outcomes, and to do so in a way that uh, essentially allows us to build systems uh, that can be practically deployed and uh, used in, uh, in, on the ground in practice uh, to mitigate the uh, impact of, uh, of these changes. So going back to the fire example, uh, there is really no good uh, fire risk model, model out there. Uh, what, what exists is really uh, these models that are very fast, uh, but grossly ina uh, inadequate and inaccurate, uh, or uh, somewhat accurate because they model the full physics, or at least the one, the, the physics that we do know about the fire, uh, yet they're very, very slow. So with, uh, one illustrative example I like to give is that it takes about four hours. Uh, uh, so a state-of-the-art fire model takes about four hours uh, to simulate 10 minutes of fire, fire spread on a big supercomputer, which means that by the time your model has simulated an acre of fire spread, the entire town of uh, Paradise has already burned to the ground. And so uh, to kind of understand how this is relevant and what we are doing uh, at, uh, at TerraFuse and in the broader scientific community, I thought I'd just take uh, the time to uh, walk through the scientific process of building models uh, as we know it. So uh, historically, uh, this has happened in, in, in this particular way. So ever since the uh, uh, you know, 1500s, uh, you know, smart people would go and gather some data, like our friend Galileo here, um, and then some other smart people would look at this data and synthesize that data into models. Uh, these models are essentially reduced uh, representations, compressed representations of that data that uh, essentially teach us something about how the world works. So these model, this, this particular model is pretty simple, uh, although with uh, extremely high impact. Uh, now, nowadays, we have even bigger models, uh, so very uh, complicated models uh, that uh, the applied math community has spent you know, the last few decades developing and understanding how they work numerically, etc. Uh, and to, to be able to compute uh, or simulate these big models, what you need is essentially a, uh, a substantial infrastructure, big computers. Uh, so here, there's a, uh, a school up the road that has you know, one of the uh, top 10 supercomputers in the world. Um, the school shall go unnamed, uh, but uh, the, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a Stanford man. Uh, so uh, what, what, what I wanted to point out here is that uh, it's typically been the same way uh, to build the way you build these models. You assume you know some physics or some uh, domain science. You model that in the computer. You discretize over space, so differentiate over space, integrate over time. Uh, you put it on a big supercomputer, which has a particular workflow of uh, performing these calculations on, you know, grids and etc. And uh, this particular facility takes about a billion core hours to simulate just uh, the weather and climate uh, uh, workloads that they have to, uh, to, to, to simulate. And this is really just one of the several dozen such facilities in this country and uh, throughout the world, which means that we as a society spent a lot of resources modeling uh, and running these simulation models about climate in particular, but other things as well. Uh, so uh, at the same time, uh, around you know, several decades ago, a, a different school of thought has uh, been forming. And I'm obviously referring to, that, to uh, machine learning and what people call big data. So essentially, the religion there has been, well, if you only gave me a whole bunch of data about the world, uh, then I will put it into my pile of linear algebra. I will do some stuff that nobody really understands, uh, no human really is able to understand, and out comes certain forecasts, certain predictions, and if those predictions are wrong, I'm just gonna stir up my pile a little bit more, and maybe the predictions will be right. Um, and so that, as a scientist, it never really set well with me, this sort of, uh, and I did my PhD in machine learning, by the way, but as, as a scientist, this never uh, set well with me because 
uh, you kind of remove and don't really consider all of this uh, 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 knowledge that has come before us. Smart people like Newton and Gauss and, and Galileo have come up with very interesting things that the machine learning models can't really um, take advantage of uh, right now. So, uh, plus they were not even that, that good <laughs> really at certain tasks. Um, that, that essentially changed uh, starting the last few years in which um, I mean, machine learning has, has, uh, has uh, uh, seen tremendous progress. Um, so around 2015, uh, machine learning algorithms could do a fundamental task, uh, or started to be, to be able to, to do this fundamental task of generating cat images. Right, so uh, this is the, uh, 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 the output of a, of, a, of a machine learning model that looks at a whole bunch of cat images and now learns something about what a cat is that allows it to generate uh, new images of new cats. Uh, and that actually was such a big deal, by the way, that uh, when I read that paper, I just, I, uh, that, that, that's when I knew I had to quit my fancy startup job here in the Valley and uh, go learn about these things. And I, I went to MIT and uh, spent some time learning about it. About two years ago, uh, computers were actually now able to generate human faces that are very believable and realistic. And even, um, this is the paper that came out last month in which uh, uh, they animate the Mona Lisa. Right? And this is all great uh, and uh, really shows or speaks to the progress that machine learning has had in the last few decades. But then the nagging question still remains, how do you put together the knowledge about the world uh, into um, these type of models that know how to deal well with lots and lots of observational data? How do you marry these two uh, together? And well, I, I'm not going to go into full de detail about this, but essentially one of my first thoughts, well, uh, with, with, with actually my college roommate was, how about we just generate the code of numerical models? And if, if only we can run these codes millions of times, we can generate enough training data that we can uh, uh, you know, train our machine learning, machine learning models with and go take over the world. But uh, we learned a lot of things since. Uh, we kind of quickly abandoned that idea. And what we're building at, uh, at TerraFuse right now is really these systems, uh, machine learning native AI systems that uh, are able to incorporate knowledge about the world in, in the form of uh, uh, physics, uh, conservation laws and equations, and uh, 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 with uh, uh, observational data um, that machine learning and AI uh, models and workflows are really good at processing and put, essentially put these two uh, pieces of, the, uh, of knowledge about the world together. And uh, what do you get from that? Well, you get a lot of uh, uh, benefits. Uh, you, you get these models that are much faster, that run much faster. You can uh, build them much faster at a lower cost and integrate real-time data for climate risk forecasting applications in particular. And I think my uh, time is up, so I will uh, leave you with that. Um, and uh, thank you. And uh, I think now I'm going to hand it over to Kara, uh, co-founder of Align Carbon. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kara Beasley, and I'm co-founder and CTO of Aligned Carbon. So some of you might be wondering what carbon nanotubes have to do with energy. And I promise they do. But to start with, I'm going to give you a little bit more background on carbon nanotubes. The goal with Aligned Carbon is the supply of material that will enable a thousand X improvement in computing, which will help make some of the problems that Adrian is looking at and mentioned uh, a little bit faster to compute. So to start with, what is a carbon nanotube? It's a really cool material. It's actually a single molecule made up entirely of carbon atoms. And if you have ever played with chicken wire, you can think about taking chicken wire, rolling it up into a tube, and then you would have a carbon at each of the wire intersections. And these can be, Single wall tubes tend to be one to two nanometers in diameter, so pretty small, but they can actually be hundreds of microns long and potentially even centimeters long have been grown. So you have a really interesting aspect ratio. And some of their really cool properties come about because they're entirely made up of sp2 bonds. So you have a delocalized cloud of electrons across the entire thing, and each tube actually counts as a single molecule. It's a closed system. So unlike graphene, where you have edges and scattering states, the tube is complete and happy and stable. Um, and it's this delocalized cloud that gives it a lot of the properties, particularly very high conductance, very low resistance, that are interesting for nanoelectronics. 
Unfortunately, when you grow them, depending on how the carbon uh, hexagons helix, you either get metallic nanotubes or semiconducting nanotubes. And that can be a problem, um, but it's also an opportunity. So generally, when you grow these, you get kind of this mangled mesh that looks kind of like cooked spaghetti if you drop it on a plate. Not super useful if you're trying to make devices or characterize single tubes. You can also grow it in vertical forests. This is actually a little bit more useful. This is uh, what has been deemed the blackest material known to man, um, is a vertical forest of nanotubes. But if you look at it, you're contacting on the top and the bottom just the tube tips. So you don't have a whole lot of surface area to contact, so it can be a little bit challenging to work with. If you instead you grow aligned arrays of horizontal tubes that are singly isolated, these start becoming a little bit more interesting for electronics and other applications where you need a controlled material. And if you can do it on a wafer scale or a larger area, now it starts to be interesting. So nanotubes have been the material of the future or the next greatest thing since sliced bread for a number of years, and they have failed to deliver on that promise. Uh, I've been growing carbon nanotubes off and on since 2005, so I've seen this carbon nanotubes are hot, carbon nanotubes are not hot. I think they're starting to come around again. Um, but to be industrially relevant, what do they need to do? Well, alignment means it's predictable. You know where the tubes are going to be, where they're not going to be. They're not crossing, they're not talking to each other. They're well behaved. You also need them to be compatible. If you can't take these nanotubes into a foundry or a fab because they're contaminated with iron, with gold, or other elements that are going to mess up a semiconductor process, then they're not particularly useful for nanoelectronics. They also then need to be pure. They either need to be purely semiconducting or purely metallic. I can't think of any application other than as an additive to paint or as a substitute for carbon fiber where a mixture is acceptable. And then they have to be manufacturable. I can't make one sample on a small piece in a lab that takes a month to do. I need to be able to do this on big wafers, a lot of wafers, and then I also have to be able to transfer the tubes because not many people want to deal with quartz as a substrate, and not many substrates will deal with the growth temperatures of eight to 900 degrees C. So at Align Carbon, we've actually managed to solve all of these. And so we are the first, the world's first and only material supplier of aligned, industrially relevant carbon nanotubes. And that gets interesting. So besides solving the materials problem, there was another shift that will make carbon nanotubes useful. This idea of traditional 2D scaling, where you're making the silicon devices smaller and smaller and smaller, and your memory is off chip, this isn't yielding much performance advance. Shifting from 10 nanometer to 7 nanometer, you're getting 1.1x improvement in performance. With carbon nanotubes, you can actually take traditional silicon on the bottom layer, add carbon nanotube logic on top. So instead of replacing silicon, as has been suggested, we're complementing it. You can then add many layers of functional nanotube logic and then put your memory directly on top. So now you're talking to the memory pixel by pixel instead of individually on the, the periphery. And this is actually a structure that was proposed and a lot of work has gone into here at Stanford with the Wong group and the Mitra groups uh, that have really demonstrated that this architecture works and simulated its advantages. So what are those advantages? So if you do monolithic 3D integration on 90 nanometer silicon devices, which is old silicon, you actually get a 75x improvement in overall energy delay product. And what does that mean? That means you have a 6.7x reduction in energy consumption. Hmm, now we're starting to talk about energy. You also get an 11x reduction in execution time. So Adrian's uh, calculations go faster. All sorts of things go faster. So instead of usually where you get energy reduction, you sacrifice performance. With carbon nanotubes and 3D monolithic integration, you get to have your cake and eat it too. And why does this matter? Well, because we have these big data centers. These things are power hungry. They are everywhere. They're going to get bigger as we do more machine learning, AR, VR. We're going to see a lot of them. And they consume a tremendous amount of energy, about 1% of the globally generated energy is used in data centers, which is about 
400 terawatt hours of energy each year. And it's only gonna get worse. Depending on who you talk to, what models you look at, it's gonna get really, really bad, or only kinda sort of bad. Um, there's been a lot of improvements in efficiency, which has made this not quite as bad as has been predicted in 2010, but it's still, it's only gonna grow. As our demand for data increases, it's only gonna get worse. Where does the power in these data centers go? In, with this uh, graph, it shows a fairly efficient data center. So 70% is going to compute, which is where you'd want it, but you've got over 20% that is going to cooling and fans. You're generating a ton of heat with these devices because they're not particularly efficient. As you squeeze more performance out of them, you get more heat. Um, and since you haven't been seeing significant, truly really significant gains as you scale these smaller, how do you get more performance in a data center? You pack it tighter. Well, now you've made your energy problems worse. So if instead we switch to this monolithic 3D architecture and that's enabled by the carbon nanotubes, I don't have to make it denser. I actually gain energy savings and improve performance, which will be huge with, sorry, in the data centers. And also, this isn't the only application. You'll also see improvements in battery life for portables. It will be impactful in many, many ways. Um, the future looks bright to me, and particularly with regard to carbon nanotubes and what they can do. Thank you. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Cody Finke, and co-founder of Brimstone Energy. <clears throat> Thanks, Cara. Okay, so I'm Cody Finke. I'm co-founder and CEO of Brimstone Energy. Brimstone Energy's mission is to make low cost, low energy, and low emissions hydrogen. When I started my PhD and I thought about energy, I thought about giant coal-fired power plants spilling CO2 into the atmosphere. And these coal-fired power plants were generating electricity. I quickly learned that electricity is not the only part of energy. Energy is also indoor heating, it is transportation, and primarily it's industrial heating, heating reactors to make fuels pressurizing reactors to make fuels. So as a young PhD student, I wanted to find a solution that could solve the entire energy pie. And to me, hydrogen seemed to be clearly that solution. I got really, really excited about hydrogen because like fossil fuels, which were what we generate energy from now, hydrogen is also a combustible material. It is a combustible gas. So I sort of got, I, I guess I fell in love with making hydrogen by splitting water, water electrolysis. It just felt so clean to me. You take water, which seems pure and clean, you add renewable electricity uh, for, from solar, from wind, and you make hydrogen and oxygen. After maybe make the air we breathe better, then we take that hydrogen, we can recombine it with oxygen. And we again make pure clean water. We can also make, renew we make renewable heat like this, or we can re make renewable electricity. We can also use this hydrogen as a commodity chemical. It's such a versatile material. I got so excited in my PhD, I started looking at the hydrogen economy. This is a figure that is prepared by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory des describing how hydrogen could fit in our economy. So right now, hydrogen is the most demanded commodity chemical in the world. It is made primarily from natural gas, but also coal and uh, other fossil fuels. And hydrogen is used to make commodity chemicals like fertilizers. Also going to be used for making plastics and many, many other uses. But hydrogen, in this hydrogen economy, instead of being made from fossil fuels, it would be made from water electrolysis. We would split water and make it cleanly. We'd use renewable electricity to make, the, to make this hydrogen. And then we'd take this hydrogen, we'd put it in our cars, and we put it in we would put it, we'd burn it at night to make electricity when the sun was down. And we'd burn it for heat to heat our homes and to heat our industrial reactors. And, we would, and the only byproduct of that was making pure water. It was so great. Got so excited that I thought maybe I wanted to start a business. 
I spent two and a half years at this point building electrolyzers to split water, and I thought I could start a business that could split water and make clean, pure hydrogen. So when you start a business, the first thing you do is you look at the economics. And, or at least that's what I felt like the first thing I should do was. And I compared hydrogen from water electrolysis to hydrogen made from fossil fuels. So, and specifically steam methane reforming, because that's mostly what we do in the United States. And this is the way we think of making dirty hydrogen. And that's the black bar in all these categories. So what I found was that water electrolysis hydrogen consumed about twice as much energy as hydrogen from steam methane reforming. If I were to power that water electrolysis hydrogen on an average US grid, and it makes 350 grams of carbon dioxide for every kilowatt hour, I would make more carbon dioxide per kilogram of hydrogen than steam methane reforming. But I was not deterred, because renewable energy, as we all know, is, getting, is cheap, and it's getting cheaper all the time. So I thought, well, we'll just power, instead of powering electrolyzers on the grid, we'll power them with renewable electricity. And what I found was that the capital cost of building electrolyzers is so high that even if elect renewable electricity is free, it's still the intermittentness of renewable electricity, the fact that the sun goes down and the fact that the wind stops blowing, makes the pr drives the price of hydrogen even higher. So when you, split, when you split water to make hydrogen, um, if you do it on, an, on a standard grid 24 hours a day, I, and also the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, estimate that hydrogen costs about $5 to make a kilogram. That's compared to $1.25 from steam methane reforming. If I only power my hydrogen off solar energy, then that hydrogen price jumps to about $11 per kilogram. What these data told me is that water electrolysis was not what I wanted it to be. It was not going to be a near-term solution to the problems that I wanted to solve. And that was, since I just spent almost three years building water electrolyzer devices, that was fairly upsetting for me. <laughs> uh, but after a few months of recovery, I decided to, that maybe I'd think about something else. So while 97% of the hydrogen today is made from fossil fuels that we consume, and again, hydrogen is the most consumed commodity chemical in the world, making hydrogen itself from fossil fuels is responsible for 1% to 3% of the global CO2 emissions. But 3% of hydrogen is made from electrolysis. So why is that 3% so cheap? And it turns out that that 3% is not water electrolysis. Uh, and, this, and this is actually not always clear in the literature. Uh, but that 3% comes from the chloralkali process. So the chloralkali process makes the sixth and seventh most demanded commodity chemicals in the world, caustic soda and chlorine. And a byproduct of that electrolytic process is making hydrogen. And that hydrogen is very, very cheap. And the reason it's cheap is because you, it co, it's made in cogeneration process with these really, really valuable commodities. So I thought, why don't we generate other commodities when we make hydrogen? Well, the first thing I looked at was sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is the third most demanded commodity chemical. If we were to replace the entire demand for hydrogen, or excuse me, the entire demand for sulfuric acid with a process that cogenerates sulfuric acid and hydrogen, we could make 10% of the current demand for hydrogen. That was pretty good. That could be you know, as much as 0.3 or half a percent of carbon dioxide emission reductions. And so I went to lab and I showed that this could happen. Um, that's, that electrolyzer is bubbling off hydrogen while it's making sulfuric acid. But the thing that was really exciting for me is that sulfuric acid and hydrogen have the same markets. The first and third, or the first and second largest markets for both hydrogen and sulfuric acid are fertilizer and oil and gas refining, respectively. So that seemed a little bit like a business. But 10% of current demand for hydrogen is not a hydrogen economy. But it is, it, it is, it is impactful and it's exciting. But I thought I need to think bigger. But the pro, if I want to co-generate commodity chemicals with hydrogen, hydrogen is the most demanded commodity chemical, that seems a little confusing on how I could think bigger. But then I found cement. So cement is not a commodity chemical per se because it's not chemically well-defined, but it is the most consumed human-made thing on the planet. 4.1 billion metric tons of, hydro, of excuse me, excuse me, of cement are consumed every year. And if we were to make the entire world's cement while co-generating hydrogen, we could make four times the current demand for hydrogen. So I again figured out a process and showed in lab a way to co-generate hydrogen and cement. 
And the thing that's really exciting me about hydrogen cement is if we do move to a hydrogen economy, then we're going to want to use hydrogen everywhere. We're going to want to use hydrogen to heat our homes, possibly fuel our cars, many other things. And cement, because it is so ubiquitously consumed, it is also ubiquitously produced. This is a picture of the United States and where all the cement kilns are, where cement is produced, let alone where it's uh, processed and consumed, all these things. As you can see, it's everywhere. So I thought, you know, maybe if these things could be co-generated, it could be well suited for, um, for hydrogen being used everywhere. But I learned from water electrolysis. So the first thing I did after looking at these processes was I looked at the economics. And I applied the same techno-economic assumptions that I used to look at water electrolysis and also the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uses to look at water electrolysis to my lab scale processes. I did that before spending two to three years you know, building a fancy reactor that does this at high efficiency. And using the data that I had already got in lab, I found that these two processes were considerably less energy intensive than making hydrogen from steam by fan reforming, between a, between a half and two thirds less energy intensive. Because of that, if they're powered on an average US grid, they also make a lot less carbon dioxide than steam methane reforming. And of course, if we use renewable energy, because these are electrochemical processes, they could make no carbon dioxide, but that probably will make these things a lot more expensive. Um, and then the best part is that according, according to these assumptions that were the same assumptions that told me water electrolysis was way more expensive than steam methane reforming, show that these processes could be at least the same price, if not much cheaper, than hydrogen from steam methane reforming. And that's starting to sound a little bit more like a hydrogen economy. So I just want to finish with what the potential impact could be. So if these technologies were deployed everywhere in the world that they could possibly be deployed, we could make about 200 million metric tons of hydrogen every year. That would be enough to supply 100% of industrial hydrogen production for industrial needs and then fuel, for example, 1.3 billion cars. Another way to say that is all of the cars in the world. So that would, that would equate to about a 10% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So this is an idea that I think I'm really excited about, and, I would like, and that's why I've started Brimstone Energy. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions during the question and answer period. Now I'm going to hand it off to Jill Foos, co-founder of Cinder Bio. So hi. Today I want to tell you about tiny things that have a big impact, and those are enzymes. And I'm going to make the argument that enzymes are the apps of the biological world. So enzymes do work inside of cells. So just like the apps on your cell phone do work for you, like send texts, calls, emails, posts, enzymes do work inside of cells, any kind of cells, bacterial cells, yeast cells, like I've showed here, plant cells, even your cells. And they do everything. They make DNA, they make chemicals, they can make energy molecules, they can even make other enzymes. And just like the apps on your phone can make you more productive, well, hopefully they make you more productive, um, enzymes make reactions go faster. They're catalysts. They always make reactions go faster. But unlike apps that are stuck on your phone, enzymes actually can do work outside of cells. And they've been doing work for us for thousands of years. So rennet is a collection of enzymes from animal stomachs that can curdle milk into cheese. Cheese is delicious, so we like cheese. And early, uh, so humans figured out that you could actually put milk into animal stomachs and make cheese. And the ancient Egyptians figured out that if you took that substance out of the animal stomach, you could make cheese in like jars, for instance. And so this was kind of the earliest form of industrial biotechnology. And we've really been looking for uh, applications for enzymes ever since. And that's because industrial biotech has great benefits. So for instance, the enzymes in your laundry detergent um, remove stains without uh, hurting the fabric. And so laundry detergents with enzymes actually perform better than laundry detergents without enzymes. 
And they also allowed manufacturers to take phosphates out of laundry detergent. And this led to cleaner lakes and rivers, so it was better for the environment. And this one application for industrial enzymes added a billion dollar application to the global industrial market, which is currently about $6 billion. But industrial biotech, so if we want to make enzymes at scale, we've got to have a production host. We've got to grow them in tanks. And for 40 years, industrial biotech has really only had two kinds of production hosts. These are like our operating systems. So you need some kind of system or host to read that DNA code and make enzymes, just like you need an operating system to use your apps. And we've only had really bacteria and yeast. And this is like our, our iOS and our Android. And just like your operating system dictates what kind of apps you can run on your phone, our production hosts, hosts dictate what kind of enzymes we can make. And these hosts live at moderate temperatures and pHs. And so it's really limited the enzymes that industrial biotech can make. But biology actually has another option. And these are archaea. They're known as the third domain of life. And the cool thing about archaea is that they live at the extremes of life. Places like this steaming acid pool of death or this volcanic hot spring. And these are environments that you couldn't survive in. And certainly, the bacteria and the yeast that are used for industrial biotech, they couldn't survive in either. But there are microbes, these archaea, that actually thrive in these environments. And so what we did is we spent over 10 years of research at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to be able to make, use archaea to make enzymes and bring Ar archaea into the fold of industrial biotech. And that's because the archaeal enzymes are really like smart chemicals. Like the operating system dictates the features of your phone, um, the, the archaea really dictate the features of these enzymes. And they have additional features that you don't get in these other enzymes, like they work in hot acid. They, um, are very, they have a broad chemical compatibility, which is unusual for enzymes. They play well with other enzymes, with chemicals. And so you can do multi-functionality. Um, you can use the chemical and you can use the enzyme. And because of the heat and the chemistry in these reactions, they go super fast. And so we want to apply these to industrial use and simplify industrial processes. So one area is cleaning in the dairy processing industry, where there's lots of equipment and pipes and membranes that have to be cleaned. They're currently cleaned with a time-consuming, multi-step process that uses a lot of chemicals. Dairy is 7% of the beverage industry, but uses 40% of the cleaning chemicals. And so by using our enzymes, we can actually combine steps of that multi-step process. And so we can clean faster. And for our customers, this means more production. So this is better performance than what they have today. And for this audience, it also means that we save energy because we're saving a tremendous amount of water uh, in cleaning. And by using our enzymes for industrial applications, we're really using them in a place where energy is consumed uh, the most. So industry is actually the biggest energy consumer, even over transportation. But we're not forgetting about transportation either. We are testing our enzymes as part of our participation in Cyclotron Road for uh, biofuels, actually degrading biomass into sugars to use for biofuels and biochemical production, um, in addition to the, the dairy cleaning application that I told you about. So we've combined uh, uh, private partnerships with public support um, to develop our enzymes for these different applications. We were very uh, pleased to be part of Chobani Yogurt's um, first food tech residency program last year. Um, and we've had great support from the National Science Foundation and also from NIH for a research application that we're developing. So at CinderBio, we're developing smart chemicals for better industry. Thanks.
is that um, it provides us a medium by which we can find out what's going on in the, the current environment, whether it's political or policy or technology. But uh, hopefully it also gives you a chance to take a look at what the future can hold. And, uh, and we're so honored to have you guys here to kind of share with us some of those perspectives. Um, so we have just uh, under 10 minutes left in this session, um, but would love to take any questions that you have for the folks on stage. Um, for example, if you had no idea what an archaea was and you're still curious, um, <laughs> like I am, <laughs> um, or any other questions you might have, uh, we can have a few minutes for Q&A before we break for, uh, for lunch for the session. <laughs> Specifically, uh, would your function be to uh, harvest, um, or do you actually make, I can't, I mean, it's an enzyme, so it exists in a natural form, correct? So you would simply be um, incubating it and, uh, and proceeding, okay, great, so it's uh, no more to the process than that. I mean, is, is it, did you just stumble upon this as a, <laughs> a great idea, or I mean, <laughs> How did, you, how did you get there? That's my question. Yeah, so um, so just for the first part, we grow the archaea in a tank, just like you would, you know, these other production hosts. Um, we don't have to harvest them from hot springs. Um, and the way we got to this, so myself and my co-founder, um, Steve, you know, we were scientists at Berkeley Lab, and we, we started on this just, you know, as curiosity, like how does life survive um, at these, in these extreme places. Um, and we, we had so early support from the Department of Energy to look at, at enzymes from, from these organisms. And um, Steve, I, I looked at a single enzyme from these organisms and Steve went off and worked on the molecular tools that actually allows us to use these organisms to produce a, a lot of enzyme at once. So they naturally make these enzymes. We're, we're not engineering the enzymes themselves. They naturally make them. But we're, what our technology is is how to get them to make a lot of that, to make them industrial re industrially relevant. Thank you. I just want to give a, a kick out to the uh, city of Palo Alto um, emerging technology for all of you folks. Okay, look for us on the web. Uh, we're a good host to um, evaluate projects and um, uh, pilots in the making. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question for Kara. Mm -hmm. So you talked about using carbon nanotubes to save energy in a data center, particularly for cooling. Can you tell us a bit more about how exactly you achieved that? Yeah, so with shifting to a monolithic 3D architecture um, enabled by the carbon nanotubes, you gain so much performance from your silicon chips or from the whole stack that you don't have to put as much energy in to get the same performance out because the performance is better. And because the tubes are not as resistive, you're, you end up uh, not generating as much heat for the same performance. So the, the tubes are not actually doing any cooling, but you're just by having more efficient uh, computing, you're using less energy and generating less heat as a byproduct. This is a question for Cody. So I applaud your out of the box thinking on sourcing <laughs> for hydrogen. And since I've never been a big fan of hydrogen because it either comes from fossil fuel or water, which we don't already have enough of. Uh, so my question is, is looking at the overall cost, so total, total life cycle costs, the, my understanding is the transportation and storage of hydrogen can be quite expensive. So have you considered that in terms of the alternatives for biofuels and things like that to compete? I don't personally work on transportation and storage. So I think um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, we're talking about the hydrogen economy. Uh, hydrogen would need to be put everywhere. Um, for me, that's several years down the road. The initial market is hydrogen as a commodity chemical. Hydrogen is currently worth $120 billion every year. It's responsible for 1% to 3% of global CO2 production. Um, it doesn't need to be transported because it's used where it's produced. Um, and that's the initial market that I'm, that I'm looking into. But there are many companies that are, not, that are not my own that are working on these problems. And if you have any suggestions of people to collaborate with, I would love to get into a, a fueling project or any other hydrogen project earlier. So thank you. In the far back. This is a question for Kara. It's sort of a follow-up to the previous question. 
Could you explain in more detail specifically what role the nanotubes play in the uh, memory logic circuit? Are they a transistor? It doesn't seem like they should be a transistor. Are they a mechanism? Do they, can they be switched from on to off? So they're a, a way of storing uh, ones and zeros. It's just not clear what functional role they're playing. Okay. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Um, so the advantages with the carbon nanotubes are twofold. They allow you to do this 3D monolithic architecture, which means your, your memory density is a lot higher and it's a lot closer to your compute. But the nanotubes themselves can actually be transistor, the transistor channel material, and you can make full um, nanotube logic and compute in there. So right now, when you have silicon devices, you have one layer of silicon devices, a whole bunch of layers of routing and packaging and planarization levels, but you can't put silicon devices on top of silicon devices because of the temperature required for doping. So you're stuck. All you get is one layer of compute. And then you have to make bigger chips, you have to make smaller silicon, and we all know the challenges with that. So with nanotubes, what you can do is you can take traditional silicon and then add carbon nanotube logic and compute on the top. So you, in a much, much smaller space, you have much denser compute. And because you now have your traditional silicon that is doing your compute, your logic, you also now have a layer that can be the, your memory access. So you can put RAM on top, you can put other low temperature silicon or low temperature memories on top of that. And the nanotubes can talk directly to the memory. Um, you don't have to have circuitry dedicated to the, the memory off chip. Does, does, this that, mean does this mean they're functioning as conductors between two different layers of silicon? No, generally, because you only have one layer of silicon. Uh, you can't have two layers of silicon devices due to the temperature required for doping. So you still have your metal layers, your metal routing layers that are traditional. Um, you just have now, instead of silicon transistors, you have carbon nanotube transistors on top. How, how big a device have you made? How many devices? And how many gates? So, <laughs> I'm actually a chemist and I don't like devices. Um, <laughs> so, I personally have not made any devices. Uh, the Wong Group and Micho's Group here at Stanford have made, uh, they've demonstrated computers. I think there were a million silicon transistors, two million nanotube transistors, a layer of RM, and then another million nanotube sensors on the top to make an electronic nose um, as a demonstration circuit. So there have been many groups that have demonstrated this architecture in academia. Uh, industry is looking at it. It's on the industry roadmaps, but nobody has demonstrated it at a large scale, partly because there's not the starting material available with the carbon nanotubes. Basically, if you want to do it, you have to grow your own. Maybe one final question to the gentleman. So my question is pretty much a follow-up to that one and to what you just <laughs> okay. said, which is, so how far off is industry from being able to do this at scale? Uh, like, are there other companies that are also working on building the layer, or if you guys are the far front, how are you going to get it into the market, and what do you uh, eventually expect the comparative price per wafer to be? So the price per wafer is going to be probably the hardest one. Um, we're right now the only ones that supply aligned, purified, transferable carbon nanotubes. Um, we're actually already selling just aligned nanotubes into the semiconductor space um, to one of the big three foundries. So they're starting on early R&D projects right now. So it will take time. It's not gonna be in your iPhone in two years. It's probably closer to seven to 10. Um, but there are other applications that may happen earlier. Um, flexible displays, RF, even nanosensors, um, we've also sold some tubes to there as well. So a lot of these applications and the potential for carbon nanotubes is bottlenecked by lack of available material that is useful. Um, you can buy train car loads of nanotubes, but they're short, they're powders, they're impure, and they're pain in the butt to work with. Um, price per wafer, carbon's cheap. My precursors are not that particularly special. Um, right now it takes, Quite a bit of energy because the growth temperature is eight to nine hundred degrees C, but we anticipate that coming down as well. Um, so I don't anticipate it being super expensive, but since you can get huge performance gains from this um, at relaxed nodes, 
Now you don't have to do EUV. Now you don't have to do quadruple patterning. There's actually quite a bit of budget that can be shifted. So if it's not super, super cheap, it might still be effective. Hopefully that answers some of it. Great. So from enzymes to cement to <laughs> microelectronics and, and data analytics, uh, kind of get a broad spectrum of the types of opportunities in the energy space. Um, thank you so much for, for attending this session. And, uh, and, and by all means, if you have a chance to, uh, to hear their story directly from, from the folks that are here, um, or if you have a, a lending hand to help them support them on their, on their vision or any other entrepreneur that you have in your own ecosystem, um, please do so. So once again, if you can give me a hand in thanking these folks and also Matt and Seth <laughs> for